AP European History with Dr. Borovkin. We continue our AP course, and today's topic will be one of the greatest leaders of 18th century, Frederick the Great of Prussia. Uh, so that comes under the rubric of enlightened uh, autocrats. So we will consider four of those. So Frederick the Great is one, but then there's also Maria Theresa of Austria, her son, Emperor Joseph II, and Catherine II of Russia. When we do this, it's very important to see what they have accomplished in terms of what Louis XVI did not. In other words, when we compare later on the causes of the French Revolution, we would see, and I'm telling you up front, there were other rulers who did things that could have prevented the French Revolution. They have to do with taxation, with education, with equality, with serfdom, and other reforms. So, so when we watch uh, the life of Frederick the Great, uh, and, and that is why he's called the Great, we will actually see that a lot of things could have been done by what Voltaire would call philosopher kings, uh, the aristocratic rulers who were uh, influenced by the ideas of enlightenment and did a lot of good reforms. So this is by way of introduction. Now about uh, the place where Frederick started. So Frederick uh, inherited the title king in Prussia, not of Prussia, which we'll discuss later, from his father, Frederick William, uh, who uh, basically was a ruler of a tiny country in the east of Europe. Uh, today, it is actually Kaliningrad Oblast. This is East Prussia, which was taken over by the Soviet Union after World War II with the capital of Königsberg. It's not even Germany anymore. But that's the origin, the city of Königsberg on the Baltic Sea. Uh, and um, uh, the, the, it was called the Grand Duchy of uh, Russia. Uh, it was surrounded on all sides by Poland, uh, Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. And it had no land connection to Brandenburg, which was its other part. So it was kind of separated, the two. So it was a very small principality. And uh, the Brandenburg part was a part of the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation. And East Prussia, or the uh, Grand Duchy of Prussia, was not. Uh, so this is the kind. And then he, he also owned a few little bits and pieces in Westphalia, so in Western Germany. So it's like a strange combination of a few dynastic pieces of land uh, united by a king, uh, which is a totally agricultural, no cultural centers, no industry. It's very sort of weak, uh, nowhere, kind of on the outskirts of Europe. That's pretty much what Prussia was uh, at the time of Frederick William. Uh, so Frederick uh, was raised uh, with a new kind of set of issues. His father was mostly interested in the military. He was uh, a typical Prussian in a sense that when we think of Prussia, we think of order, of military discipline, uh, of very strict rules, strict morality, very upright kind of Protestant, Lutheran, uh, dictatorial approach. Uh, and, and he wanted the same thing from his son. So one of the first dramas of Frederick's life is his, con is his conflict with his father. Uh, now, Frederick was not what his father wanted him to be. He was a kind of a meek boy who was interested in languages and books. He had a, a thousand books library, and he kept reading and reading and reading. He actually spoke amazingly. Uh, in addition to classical education, his, which, which means that he read Latin and Greek and Hebrew, on top of it, he could fluently speak English, but his grandmother, well, his, his relatives were in England, the Hanoverian uh, kings. So he spoke English, he spoke fluent French, his favorite language for daily communication, obviously German, uh, Portuguese, and Spanish. Uh, so this is, uh, this is his key. He played the flute. He composed sonatas. Uh, he was, uh, it was a strange youth from the point of view of his father. You know, he, that's not the kind of a military command that Frederick William wanted to have, a guy who is playing flute and, and reading Voltaire. Uh, so this was um, 
Uh, but of course, his father was totally wrong. Uh, the amazing thing is that he is going to be uh, a composer of sonatas and a greatest general of Europe in the 18th century at the same time. So this is the amazing uh, combination of talents that Frederick inherited. So uh, Frederick, um, in his youth, he uh, reads a lot and he uh, enters into correspondence with Voltaire. He writes him a letter full of admiration. That's about 18, um, 17, 34, 35. And Voltaire responds, encouraging this young philosopher king to continue his studies and so forth. Uh, and the first contact between them uh, produces a book which is called Anti Machiavel, uh, which actually was published in Amsterdam under a false name by uh, Voltaire. Voltaire was the publisher. He, he, he contacted the publishers. He, he organized the whole enterprise. So in this book, Anti Machiavel, uh, the uh, young Frederick discusses the nature of government. Uh, and obviously, his most important uh, thesis here. So, as I was saying, in the book anti uh he introduces a, a new idea, which is morality and responsibility of the monarch. And in some way or another, uh, he's going to, to live up to this, although uh, he, he, he's going to go to war very shortly. Uh, and so some people argue that the fact that he goes to war, you know, violates his... Uh, a principle of morality, but that, that's not exactly right. That what he meant was what he did live up to, uh, and that is his most famous phrase, uh, a king is the first servant of the state. This is probably, in terms of political theory, his most important contribution, uh, because up to this point, the absolute monarchy is based on the idea, l'état c'est moi, I am the state. He rephrases it in a way that makes it revolutionary new. And no. It's not that I am the state, I am the first servant of the state. In other words, there is a state, and what a ruler has to do is to be the caretaker of that state. He has to do everything for the state, which also means for the people. So he introduces the idea as a ruler, uh, and the king and the prince is a kind of a caretaker of his government, of his people, and of his state. So the well-being of the people and of the state is the first duty of the king. And that is somewhat different than the French kings, uh, who pretty much didn't care about anything but their own well-being. Uh, anyway, it was a great success. The book was a hit. It, it was published, it, and then people started asking questions, who was it? And then very, very quickly it became known uh, that it is Frederick. Uh, so this has started a friendship that lasted for many, many years. Uh, and then later in his life, he invited Voltaire to come to his gorgeous palace, Saint Souci, um, which I'll show you pictures of. Uh, and, and then he gave apartments in Saint Souci to um, Voltaire. And he lived there for, for a few years uh, with attending all kinds of uh, performances and dinners and and I was in Saint Souci, and they had an exhibition of, of what daily life was like. Uh, and, and it would be like typical, his day would be, you know, receiving letters and so forth. But in the afternoon, uh, they would assemble in the, uh, in the dining hall and would be six, five, six, uh, from six to, to eight people. Uh, one of them actually was an Italian opera singer. So there was a female company as well. Uh, and philosophers, among them Voltaire. Uh, and other guests, and then they would, they, this is, would be his favorite pastime. They would be talking about politics uh, and philosophy. And then sometimes uh, Frederick himself would play the flute, uh, and then the opera singer would sing, uh, and then they would perform, um, and then there would be musicians invited uh, to perform in these. Uh, interestingly enough, right next to Saint Souci, there was a, a, a theater built as a part of the palace. Uh, actually, it's a part of the Grand Palais. Uh, and uh, no church. There was no church. All other palaces have a church inbuilt with them. Uh, he, he didn't care about the church, and so he didn't have one. But he did have a theater uh, as a part of his palace. Well, in any case, um, 
the first thing he does when he becomes king uh, in 1740 uh, is go to war. Uh, and, and so this is why a lot of people question his anti Machiavelli pieces. The war with uh, Austria over a province called Silesia. Uh, Silesia is a province that today is, is owned by Poland, and it was a, a gift to Poland by Comrade Stalin after World War II. It was detached from Germany, given to Poland, even though it was a German-speaking territory and had pretty much no Polish population. But uh, Stalin wanted to punish Germany, so they, he cut off pieces of it and gave it to Poland. So the Poles actually should be very grateful to Comrade Stalin because at least a third of their territory, maybe more, uh, that they have today are uh, pieces of Germany that Stalin gave it to them, uh, to the modern Polish state. In any case, uh, he goes to war over Silesia, um, uh, confronts uh, a young empress, uh, Maria Theresa. So she is, um, she just inherited her throne. Sorry. She just inherited her throne, and uh, it is her first year in power, and it is his first year in power, and they go to war. And uh, this is the first time that Frederick shows his talents as a military leader, and he wins. And uh, this is called the First Silesian War, uh, and uh, he annexes Silesia, which significantly increases his, uh, his uh, domain. Uh, immediately in Silesia, he shows his uh, inclinations, uh, which means that Silesia is Catholic, and, he, and there's no problem for them. He, so he shows his toleration immediately. Um, that, that they can keep their religion, they can keep their self-government uh, and, and uh, his uh, self-rule and, and so forth. Now, one thing that needs to be mentioned about this war is that uh, theoretically it was not over Silesia but over something that's called pragmatic sanction. So I have to explain to you what that is. Pragmatic sanction, sanction means to allow. Uh, pragmatic means because of pragmatic pragmatism because of reality. So what that means basically is that Maria Theresa uh, was a, a woman, obviously, uh, and she becomes empress of the Holy Roman Empire because there's no male heir. But by the rules of the game uh, that were established, there couldn't be a female emperor. So uh, her father uh, knew that this is a problem and he uh, introduced this concept that's called pragmatic sanction, which means that all the kings and em all the kings, not emperors, all the kings of Europe, had to agree. Yes, it's okay uh, that a woman will become the empress, uh, and uh, most countries did, but they asked something in return. Uh, but there were several that didn't, and that was uh, Prussia. Uh, Prussia, I think, France. Uh, and the Russia, they didn't, and all the others did. So that means that Frederick refused to recognize her as the empress, uh, and that was casus belli. This was a cause to go to war, but in fact, it was really his desire to take over Silesia. Don't forget to put your likes and to tell your friends and to subscribe to AP European History with Dr. Brofkin.